Hi, I'm Peggy Farron. Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Today we're talking to John Nelson about GoPro cameras. Now this is a topic I've wanted to talk about ever since I started the show, and here we are, 190-something episodes in, we're finally getting around to talking about GoPro, so stay tuned. The Understand Photography Show is a podcast, so please subscribe to us on iTunes or iHeartRadio, however you listen to, to podcasts. And if you leave us a review on iTunes, that helps us come up in the search engines more than anything. Now our signature class at Understand Photography is called the Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography. Our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. So if you felt a little nervous about taking an online class, just go to our website, understandphotography.com, and watch our free webinar. See if you like the teaching style. The Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography is an online course but it's interactive. So you have an instructor, me, <laughs> so you have to you have homework, you have to turn it in, you get critiqued on the homework, don't worry, I'm really nice. But the class itself is really good because we have pictures with arrows, push this button. We're gonna, yes, we're gonna teach you the concepts in photography, but we're also gonna teach you how to do it on your camera. Whether you have a Canon, a Sony, a Nikon, whatever, we, we find out what kind of camera you have before the class and we cater to you all, okay? Four weeks to proficiency in photography. It does have start dates, so go to understandphotography.com to find out when the next class is starting. And while you're on our website, just click on freebies You'll see a big thing that says click here for freebies and sign up for our mailing list and in return we'll give you something free. <laughs> That's kind of fun. All right, so my guest today is John Nelson. I was actually Joe Fitzpatrick and I were speaking at a camera club and and John got up and he made a talk about, he, well wait till you hear, he's a very interesting guy. And then he said something about GoPros, and I'm like, GoPro, I've been looking for somebody to talk about GoPros for so long. So I'm going to kind of introduce you in, with you here, okay? That's so fine. welcome, That's John. Fine. Thank you for driving over, because you, you came much. from... No, I came from the uh, Martin County area, Stewart. And how far is that? Uh, about 150 miles away. So you, thank you for, that's a long drive. Yeah, thank no you problem. for coming. It's nice to have it in the studio. Yeah. So now, photographer, wildlife videographer, Document, documentary, documentary. Docu docu yeah, whatever. People yeah. say it differently. Yeah. Filmmaker. <laughs> Filmmaker, there you go. That there works. There you go. Um, Radio broadcaster. Um, voiceover artist. Voiceover artist, uh, president of Audubon and Martin County. Uh, very passionate about birding and, and wildlife in general. And you have a little radio segment, right? Or Yeah, yeah we do a radio segment that's published in three market areas here in Florida called the Audubon Moment. Uh, and uh, it's broadcast rather in, in, in uh, the Martin County area, Treasure Coast area of Florida, uh, also up in the uh, uh, Tallahassee market area, and then over in Panama City. No, that's interesting. Yeah, that's no yeah. kidding is what yeah. I meant and to we're, say. And we're upgrading a lot of our materials right now. We're going to be making a push uh, to try to take this nationally here in another six months or so. That is so exciting. Wow. Uh, you know, we've been doing it for 10 years. And uh, we initially got a, a grant from uh, from National Audubon Society for ten thousand dollars to get the, pro the the project started, and uh, so yeah, it is. It's very exciting. It's something I really love to do. And your film is my film is called uh, America's Amazon: The Story of the St. Lucie River. The St. Lucie River is a, a a river that is on the Treasure Coast that back in the uh, late 1800s was literally called America's Amazon because of its sheer rugged nature and the amount of wildlife diversity that it had. And there were people that would take uh, industrial elites, you know, millionaires down into the Treasure Coast to go hunting and fishing along the Treasure Coast. And it was actually one of the very first places in the nation where the economy developed because of ecotourism. Unfortunately, 125 years later, the river, like the Caloosahatchee River over here on the west coast of Florida, is nearly dead from algae blooms and just huge amounts of pollutants and nutrients that have come in and killed off almost everything in the river. Wow. And so this documentary, and it is a documentary, uh, you know, shows the 125-year progression that took place from the time of its early settlement on the Treasure Coast until today, you know, where we have these huge pollution problems that are literally killing off fish, killing off oysters, and 
the water is so dangerous that you're not even allowed to touch it. Wow. And people don't think of that as something that would happen in Florida, the Sunshine State. Yeah. And yet uh, it's happening every day. Wow, wow. Yeah. So how do we find your, your documentary the, the film? Theaudubonmoment.com. Okay, that's on the radio. What about the film? Uh, you can find the film on theaudubonmoment.com as, oh. as, a, as a video right now. It's not, it's not released on YouTube yet. Okay. Um, maybe about a year from now it might be released on YouTube. For, right but now, you can buy just, the DVD. Right. Okay, cool. <coughs> and you're supporting Aud Audubon? Or uh, no? we're, supporting, we're supporting Audubon. We also support the Florida Oceanographic Society, uh, the local public radio station, uh, and the uh, local historical uh, society. Wow. All right. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you have a lot going on. That's the tip of the iceberg. Ah! <laughs> tip of the iceberg. I still do voiceover work. I was doing voiceover work for a, a, a commercial endeavor last night, uh, just before I, I hit the hit the, the sack. And uh, I also still do um, educational videos for local area nonprofits and in, uh, in in and around the Treasure Coast. Awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about your relationship with the GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> the GoPro is, is a wonderful tool, and uh, the GoPro, the best summary of a GoPro is the GoPro to a camera is what the iPhone is to a phone. Just so totally and completely revolutionized photography that it's, it's hard to believe that, that a little teeny tiny box that measures about uh, two inches tall by two and a half, three inches wide, can pack so much punch. You know, I'm sure that your radio audience is all familiar with what a GoPro is, and, and we've all seen GoPro footage of, you know, people surfing waves or flying in, you know, in, you know, flying in, in small airplanes or windsurfing or, you know, skydiving, whatever it happens right. to be. Um, Ten years ago, those kind of shots would have been absolutely impossible. Or if they could have been done at all, it would have cost you know, tens of thousands of dollars in equipment, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment, if they could be shot at all. Uh, so the GoPro has, has really been an, an incredible camera. And as, a, as a, a videographer, I love using it. Okay, so let's, let's uh, now tell me, you said that the history of the GoPro was really interesting. <coughs> the history of the GoPro, and I'll make it real short, um, a guy by the name of Nick Woodman, who is the, the uh, creator and the owner of the business, uh, he and his girlfriend were fresh out of college. He graduated in 1997, and he had a couple of failed business adventures uh, that were technology related, and he was all bummed out. So he and his girlfriend decided to go surfing in Australia. Well, he had, you know, he was with a bunch of other friends, and a bunch of his friends were, were wanting to become pro surfers, but they needed to have pictures that could really show what they were doing. And at the time, the only thing that was available was long telephoto lenses from the shore that would capture them surfing the waves. But they wanted something that had a lot more intimacy to it, if you will. Okay. And, uh, and, and as the urban legend says, one day on the beach, these guys are saying, oh, dude, man, these waves are just so totally gnarly. Oh, I wish there was just some way of being able to capture this. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and somebody else pipes in and says, yeah, man. That would be so cool, man. I want to go pro. I really want to go pro. And if you could get me some pictures like that, you'd be a hero. And there, uh, and there is the name of the company and the camera, uh, GoPro Hero. Uh, um, and that supposedly comes from reliable sources. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's a great story. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but, but it sounds good. It does sound good. Uh, but the GoPro camera was developed originally as a surfing camera, and it was developed as a 35 millimeter camera. Uh, the very first GoPro uh, came preloaded with, uh, with ISO 400 film, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and it had about 10 to 12 shots. And um, then you would, you know, you, and it was a wrist-mounted camera because uh, it was wrist-mounted because you're surfing and, uh, and they would be surfing out there and they just stick out their, their arm and, you know, and do their thing. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as the, the company went on, and incidentally, that, that particular camera sold $150,000 worth, uh, worth of cameras in the first year. Oh, it was wow. very difficult to get the company started, and in fact, Nick Woodman had to take a loan from his father for $250,000. Wow, nice to have a dad that has that yeah. kind of money to loan. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> but uh, 
<laughs> but after the first year, oh. things started to pick up. And uh, after the introduction of the 35 millimeter GoPro, then they made their first digital camera. The first digital camera uh, GoPro could shoot approximately 10 seconds worth of video before you had to download it and then start over again. That makes sense. But, you know, back in the day in 2004, 2005, you know, hey, that was that was big time. I, that was I, really big time. Yeah, well, so they digital, would, digital just kind of started coming about, what, in 2000, I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah about right? that. About that. So yeah, I remember my very first digital camera I had was a little Olympus, a digital camera. That, uh, it had a half a half a meg of, uh, you know, that was this, this full-size chip was a half a meg. So, you know, yeah, things have come a long way. Yes. But... Uh, but yeah, you know, once they started, it's interesting, you know, once they started getting into digital and then they started experimenting with different types of mounts instead of just a wrist mount, they suddenly said, well, man, maybe we could put this on a boat or maybe we could put it on the, on the front of a surfboard. Right. And so they developed things like suction cup mounts or maybe we could put it on, on a motorcycle. We could, we could glue it onto a guy's helmet. You know, and you know, one thing led after another. And one of the neat things about GoPro cameras is that because they're, they become the industry standard for what they call action cameras, um, the mounting hardware that you can buy for these things is, I mean, it's, it's almost beyond belief. I mean, you, in fact, I, I have three or four boxes worth of mounting hardware and you kind of use them like Legos. And you just, you know, you, you can build your own stuff. You now know, tell us about the main one you <laughs> use for video, the main yeah. mount. What, uh, one of the things that, that you can buy is called a helmet mount uh, arm. And what it does, it, you, you um, mount it to your helmet and it reaches out over the front of your helmet so that you can look down on yourself or you have a clear vision of, of what somebody, say if you're mountain biking, you have a clear vision of, of, of the trail without having, having your head in the way. Well, what I did is I took that helmet, uh, that helmet mounting arm and I simply put a hot shoe on it and then I put that on my camera, on my 35 millimeter or my, my digital SLR camera and it allows the GoPro to go out over the front of my long 500 millimeter telephoto lens. Oh, otherwise the lens would be in the shot. Exactly. So what that allows me to do is when I'm shooting, I can shoot both wide and telephoto at the same time. Now the GoPro is always a wide angle lens, right? It is, but it has digital lenses. It has digital lens uh, capabilities within it. Uh, there are settings within a GoPro that allows you to go what they call narrow, medium, or wide. Uh, so you know, digitally you I did can not know that. yeah, digitally you can you can enhance the 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 angled view, um, depending on the type of, of film or film. I keep on saying film, uh -huh. the type of of um, format that you're looking at. Uh, the GoPro camera that I use is not a new one at all. It's uh, the three plus, which in the evolution of GoPro cameras was really the first true. Um, really modern video camera that you can use for cinematography. You can actually shoot in 24 frames a second in 2.7K uh, video with these little things. And uh, we just, in fact, the video that we were talking about, America's, America's Amazon, we premiered that at the Lyric Theater in Stewart to a sellout crowd of 500 people. And part of the film was created with this little GoPro camera and the 2.7K video on, on a 60 foot wide screen was just fabulous. Wow. Yeah, it, it was really good. Now how much video can you record? Like how many minutes? Well, it depends on, on what format you're shooting in, uh, 2.7K, uh, and also it depends on the card. You know, I, have, I use, typically use a 64, uh, uh, 64 gigabyte card, uh, but you can, you can easily shoot an hour or more with that. Wow, yeah. okay. Yeah, and if you're shooting just 1080, you can do much more than that. Um, so. And for most of us, like YouTube, that's 1080p, right? That's all you yeah, need, 1080p right? 1080p is pretty, pretty good. But as the cameras developed, you know, again, you know, we, we started off with the 35 millimeter GoPro, then they went to the GoPro, the original GoPro Hero, which was that digital one that would operate for 10 seconds at a time. And then the real, the, the real step forward was with the GoPro 2 that allowed 1080, 1080p and, and actual cards that you could put in there and, and, and you know, load your stuff directly onto a card. Uh, the 3 and especially the 3 Plus 
uh, really took things a step further because like I said that allowed you to go into uh, 2.7k video okay. uh, multiple formats you could start doing slow motion video with these things um, there's just lots of different things that you can do with them and and most people don't realize it but they even have pro settings on these so you can go in and change the light meter settings on it uh, there, there's lots of things that you can do if you just read the manual <laughs> Oh, who wants to do that? I know, you know, manuals <laughs> suck, don't they? <laughs> but uh, so, it's, it's so amazing. tell us what you use this for mostly. Well, it depends on my project. When I'm shooting oh, okay. wildlife, especially when I'm shooting birds, for example, uh, there are two times the year where we have uh, what we call numerations, where there's large, huge flocks of birds, and it's really nice to be able to get a nice huge wide angle shot of 5,000 birds flying through the air at you. Well my GoPro will allow me to do that but at the same time I'd like to be able to use my 500 mil you know and get really tight close-up shots of a hundred or two hundred birds you know all coming at you. Well I can do both of those at the same time by mounting my GoPro camera on my uh, on my digital SLR I can use a remote control, which come, which you know can uh, can be used to activate as many as ten different GoPro cameras at a time. You know, obviously I don't. And use is that, that an option that GoPro sells? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have a remote control. I actually have three GoPro cameras. Okay. Uh, and there's times when I'll, I will use all three of them at the same time. Uh, but uh, again, I, you, know, you, you can put the remote control on your wrist or wear it around your neck, whatever you want to do. And so when I'm shooting video, I can shoot both my wide and my telephoto video at the same time. And that. when you're editing then, you can start off with this beautiful wide angle shot of these thousands of birds coming at you and seamlessly all of a sudden you're right there on, you know, on a, a really, really tight telephoto shot. Without and you can tell that it's in so perfect sync. So you just sync. splice those together in editing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's one way that I use Even it. Even though they don't call it splicing anymore, do they? Yeah, they don't call it splicing. <laughs> but yeah, I know. But I know. No, the you know, they don't call it tape anymore either. But I know it's hard to it's hard to change your vocabulary. <laughs> it is sometimes. Yeah, like I said, you know, I always talk about film. But I know. could see, you know, for my bird photography friends who are into still photography. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could be using their 500 millimeter lens for still photography, yet taking videos as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, some of the other things I've used this for, I've uh, done a number of trips over to Haiti uh, on medical mission trips uh, with, uh, with groups of, of uh, nurses and doctors, and a GoPro camera, you know, on a, what some people call a selfie stick. Uh, you can prop it up and, and get down into a, a really tight group of people without any problem whatsoever, no intrusion. Uh, GoPro cameras also allow you to uh, video or take pictures uh, with complete anonymity. Uh, you can, when you typically turn on a GoPro camera, when you're videotaping, a orange light will come on flashing to show that you're, you're, you're videotaping. But if uh -huh. you don't want people to know that you're videotaping, there's an option where you can turn that off. Ooh, sneaky. Sure, sure. <laughs> and well, one example, we were, at a, we were at a market in this village up on, on top of, a, of an island called Laganav in Haiti, and we were told beforehand that people really don't want to have their pictures taken. But I really wanted to be able to have this market scene of you know, going through the market and seeing all the vendors and stuff. So I simply turned off any outward appearance that the camera was on. I put it on a chest harness, which you, know, you can get for a GoPro. So it's and facing, it's on yeah, your so chest it's, facing, yeah, facing out facing while out. you're walking around. Exactly, and, and you just turned it on. But it looks like it's not turned on. But exactly, it looks like it's not turned ah. on. And, and they're always thinking that you know, you're going to have to put a camera up to your eyes you know, to be able to take a picture. Well, yeah. it's on all that time. And then you simply go back and edit out what you want. Now, how is the stabilization if you're walking around with it on your chest? Well, it's not, it's not the great, obviously, it's not the greatest, obviously, uh, in that type of a situation. But then again, you can go back in, depending on the type of software you're using for, for uh, you know, linear editing, you can uh, do image stabilization that way. In the software? I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's not the best option, but for that type of, of, a, of a shooting assignment, you know, you have to, you, you have to do what you do. Uh, obviously, there's other stabilization tools that are made for GoPros, and again, because GoPro is the industry standard for action cameras, 
everybody makes accessories for GoPros. So I have a Removu uh, digital, uh, you know, three-axis video stabilizer uh, that I can mount this onto, and it operates off of batteries. And as soon as you turn it on, no matter what you do with the camera, it's always staying, you know, in 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 great synchronized, uh, you know, position. Okay, now that is something. The stabilizer you hold with your hand. You can hold it uh, with your like, hand, or it's you can, or, like you, a, or you can put it on a pole, or you know. You and could you use that stabilizer? What's the name of the stabilizer? It's called a Removu. Uh, Removu? Yeah, R-E-M-O-V-U. Can you use that on a cell phone as well? Uh, some of them you can, yeah, some of them you can. I wonder, because to me that seems like the best of both worlds, if it could go both ways. Yeah. Uh, they do make, they do make uh, some that, that have the option of, you know, in fact, they even make some that you can put a full uh, uh, digital SLR on those. You know, it just depends on how much money you want to pay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, me being the, the cheap and expensive photographer that I am, I found my remote who used through uh, an outfit called KEH Camera and I was able to buy that digital stabilizer unit for about 125 bucks you know, in like new condition when it normally goes for about $200. Nice. Yeah. KEH is a great company. KEH is a real good company. You know, and, and I shouldn't tell this because you guys are all going to be bidding against me now, but if you really want great deals on, on used camera equipment, you go to shopgoodwill.com. Okay. And shopgoodwill.com has all of the best equipment from the National Goodwill chain. And they put it online and you can bid on it. And generally speaking, I mean, I get, I get a lot of my Nikon lenses from shopgoodwill.com, DX format Nikon lenses. You pay 20, 30 cents on the dollar for them. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. So anyhow, yeah, I, you know, I use my, you know, I use the thing for, you know, the, the, my GoPro for field assignments like that up in Haiti. I've used it uh, for trucking through the woods, you know, to try to show, you know, action while I'm searching for birds. Uh, we, Do you prefer to put it on a helmet or on your chest? Um, it depends Is on the, it depends on the situation. No, not necessarily. Okay. I mean, you know, a, a hat or helmet cam is, is really nice because you don't, don't have to worry about, you know, getting caught up in anything else you're carrying. But then again, if there's a lot of branches and stuff that you're, tr you know, trudging through, you know, that can be a whole other issue. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, th those are just some of the ideas. I mean, you know, these things are, you know, you see them used all the time in uh, Hollywood productions, uh, in cars. Uh, you know, you, have, you can have suction mounts. Uh, and uh, you'll see them on uh, the History Channel. They use them all the time, every single every single episode. Like what? Uh, when the, the History Channel, when they're doing uh, American the American Pickers, uh, for example, and uh, you know the American Picker guys are talking to each other inside their van, and and you know they're laughing about whatever. They're talking to Daniel back at home base. All of those pictures are done with GoPros with a suction. Where do they mount those inside uh, on the, the windshield. car? In, on the windshield. So they have a suction mount on suction the windshield. Suction mount on the windshield. And it, the camera's wide enough to get both of them, or oh, do easy, they have two? Easy. Oh, easy. easily wide enough yeah. to get two people in the camera. But yeah, they'll the, put they'll put two or three GoPro cameras, you know, in the in, in the van. You know, so they get different angles, and they have an angle where they can have both of them together. They'll have a different one. You know, there's just Frank, or the other one is just you know the other guy. Now, what about the sound? Do you have to have sound? The, I, I would imagine the sound's not that great. The newer GoPro cameras have had tremendous improvements in sound quality. Because I'm amazed at the iPhone. If When you do an iPhone video, the, the microphone is really good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so. no, a GoPro camera, the new GoPro cameras, the, the GoPro 6s, 7s, and 8s, uh, the sound quality is exceptional. Uh, the GoPro 3, the one that I use, the 3 Plus, sound quality is not that great, especially if you put it, well, if you put it inside an underwater camera housing, then that's a whole other story. And, and I use this underwater all the time as well, by the way. Uh, when we're talking about, for example, how, you know, um, you know, seagrass beds are dying. Well, you know, I can put this on a pole, and even though the camera is upside down, when I put it down in the water, the camera has a setting where you can invert the images right back up, even though the camera is upside down. And so I can get fabulous pictures of seagrass beds. Uh, we were up in Alaska filming. I would put this down into a river where there was a salmon run, and you can get, you know, doesn't bother the salmon any. You know, they just swim around it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. Yeah. And, and yeah. now the, the waterproof casing is part of what made it so popular. Exactly. The, the original waterproof casing that comes with this was rated for 197 feet. 
Yeah, I mean. Oh and, my goodness! And, be, and before you, before just to give you an idea how revolutionary these cameras are, you know, if you had a camera that was rated for 197 feet in depth, the camera housing, not the camera, because you had to buy the camera housing separate. The camera housing alone would set you back two or three thousand dollars at least. Oh, at least, because I've least. interviewed some underwater photographers, and yeah. most of them don't own their own underwater housing. They work for some company that. Yeah, well, or you can rent them out on an on because an it is. Basis. I thought they were saying like thirty five hundred and up. I could be wrong. No, you, you could be right. You could be right because I'm not. It an was expert really in that. expensive. But for the very, housing. Yeah, they're very expensive. Whereas you can get a camera housing for this for about ten bucks. <laughs> you know, and, and it and it does the same thing. So you know, again, it, it just it blows you away. You know how affordable this technology has become. It does fantastic shots with uh, with uh, slow motion video. Uh, depending on the model of GoPro you have, you can do, you can t take video at up to 240 frames a second, which gives you phenomenal slow slow motion. Now, one of the things I like about the GoPro in general is, I, of course, I didn't know it could do all these things, but in general, it's pretty easy just to turn it on and take some video without. It's a point without and shoot camera. reading the man manual. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you never want to read the manual, it's a point and shoot it's camera. It's pretty simple to use. Yeah. Because yeah. mine, I, I hardly ever use mine, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, actually I did, um, there's a company called Aqua Media, it's an mm -hmm. internet company, and they hired me to do like an underwater um, photography class for people who like to do like portraits underwater, like, Oh know. yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, that's an in, uh, yeah a so we thing used now. GoPros and we just we weighted them down on stands and we had a uh -huh. couple of them and we had the model doing the cool stuff underwater. And yeah. No, the last time I was I was in Haiti, uh, this, like I said, this island of Laganov, which is where we typically go to, just right off the island, they have beautiful coral reefs, and uh, you know this little GoPro, you know, you know, just handheld with, in, you know, while you're diving, you know, snorkeling along the coral reefs, just gives you phenomenal footage. And again, you put that on 2.7K with ultra wide angle, and uh, it's 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 Hollywood. I mean, it's it's there. That's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Now, is the lens pretty? The lens must be pretty good for. It's a good lens, and as and I we're at a very small aperture though, because everything is sharp, right? Yeah, it has a minimum focal distance of seven inches. Okay, now, so it can focus in seven inches away. Wow. That's right. Yeah. Now that's for the GoPro three plus. Uh, I don't know what the technical specs are for the for the for six the sevens ones. or eights. Okay. Uh, the other thing that is that has come out now is the Go, GoPro. They now have what they call a GoPro Fusion, which allows you to do 360 degree uh, video shooting, which I don't know hardly anything about. I don't know anything about that either, yeah. but I should have a show on that because I, I don't know anything about it. I'd be interested. Yeah, but uh, and like I say, the sound quality has gotten so much better as well. But uh, like I said, if you if you're a documentary uh, filmmaker, if you're a wildlife filmmaker, uh, if you're an action filmmaker. I mean, you know, a GoPro can go anywhere you you want and can and can can fit into your your, your filming requirements. What about stills? It does uh, great still photography. Now the GoPro three and the three plus, <coughs> excuse me, three plus, uh, the uh, uh, pictures are limited to twelve mega uh, megabits in, or megabytes in size, rather. Uh, the newest versions are up to sixteen, which. Is That's not not terribly a lot compared to some of our DSLRs. Still but, pretty pretty it's decent. Still, it's still pretty <laughs> decent, exactly. Uh, you can put them in burst mode where you can do either between three and ten and ten shots in a, in a, a one second time period. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, use the camera to do uh, uh, time lapse photography. Oh, I love time yeah. lapse. I do my with my cell phone all the time. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, you can do, you can I do love time it when lapse. it's easy. I should say because doing time lapse on the DSLR is is complicated. It's in, yeah, it's a lot of setup, but no, it's not that difficult on this. And then GoPro has software that you can use with your with your phone or on your computer uh, that allows you then to take all those time lapse singles and stitch it into a in, into a video. Okay, uh, the, so it. It has software that comes with it. Also, yeah, and the software and is all free. What is the software? What does it do? Uh, it, Besides, it's do the it, time lapse, obviously. Well, it, it actually act, it can act as a basic video editor if you'd like. If you don't have any other video editing tools. Seriously. Yeah. But can it do two lines? 
Uh, like that, two cameras? No, no. I, I don't think it Just can like do that. Kind of I, like I don't know that for a fact, but I don't think it can. Okay. Because that was, you know, I, I settled on Camtasia because, for my video editing, because um, it's easy to use was the main reason, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I could sync two or three cameras or sure. sound waves or whatever where, you know, all the free stuff, that, like the Windows stuff and the iMovie, all that stuff, it's just one yeah. line of video. Yeah, I, well, I, I use uh, Apple Final Cut Pro 10. You know, but see, that's expensive. Uh, and, and Adobe Premiere is expensive uh, and complicated actually, and complicated to learn. Actually, my Apple Final Cut Pro 10, I bought that seven years ago. I, I just graduated from Indian River State College with a, a associate's degree in digital media. And um, in fact, I was the oldest person to ever go through the program. Uh -huh. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but you know, I'm 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 up there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the the neat thing about Apple's uh, Final Cut Pro 10 is that you pay one price, and it was only it was three hundred dollars. But after that, all of the upgrades for the last six or seven years have been scot free. No kidding. No See, kidding. that's not the way I remember it because nope, I haven't paid. I it. think I paid almost three hundred dollars for Camtasia, but I thought it was a lot less money. But it was definitely a lot less complicated. Yeah, well, that, it, and you know, I'm sure that's the case because you know I can have multiple cameras, I can have multiple soundtracks. Uh, when I was producing my video, America's Amazon, for example, uh, I would have a, uh, a one or two cameras that would be going at a time. I would have my narration soundtrack, my voiceover soundtrack. I would have an audio music soundtrack for background music, and I would have, uh, you know, I would have a foley. I would have effects. Right. Uh, you know, if you know, the tractor is going in the field, I'd put a tractor, you know, tractor yeah, right, sound in right. there sometimes, yeah. that, that type of thing. So, I mean, you can easily have three, four, five different audio soundtracks on there, and you can control those all. So, yeah. So, you know, Final Cut Pro. No, I know. I used Final Cut Pro back in my wedding videography few days, and then I went, then I switched to Premiere Pro. Yeah, yeah, Premiere Pro is a really good Which was very one too. similar. Yeah. But then I remember downloading Premiere Pro. I don't. I'm gonna. Say, it was probably five years ago because I hadn't used it in ten years. And I, I was like, oh my God, this is hard. I didn't want to. I didn't want to go through the learning curve, you know. And then the Camtasia came along, and look at how easy that was. That's why I bought that. Yeah. But anyway, all right. Let's get back to this GoPro. What's the craziest, most creative shot you've ever done on a GoPro? Well, I wouldn't say it was the craziest, but uh, from a theatrical standpoint, the most visually appealing was uh, using this on a on an airboat, putting it on the on the front of an airboat oh, while wow. we're going through Lake Okeechobee at a high rate of speed and and you know watching all the birds part and that kind of thing. Uh, again, just really visually stunning. That you know, is so cool. Yeah, and again, you just put that put that on a mount, and then you've got your remote control. You know, you're sitting back there with with the, the captain. And you just turn it on and off as you need, and it's no big deal. How much do the newer ones cost? Like the six, seven, eight, whatever you said it was up well, to. Well, that's a really. I'm glad you asked that question because one of the things that GoPro is experiencing, they're experiencing some growing pains. Yeah. And they're discovering that phones like the new, uh, you know, iPhone 11. Yeah. Uh, is really starting to compete against against their their type of photography, and they discovered it you know, about two or three years ago that some of their equipment it was perceived that it was overpriced. Most of their equipment has never been more than $500, which right. I think is fair. I thought it was pretty good uh, price. However, they realized that Well, they, the problem is China started making all the knockoffs. Well, everybody does that, but, yeah. but like I said, depending on how involved you get with it, I mean, you know, if you want the accessories, GoPro is the way to go. But uh, they have entry-level cameras now that are still phenomenal that you can get for 200 bucks. So two hundred dollars. I mean, if you can't afford two hundred dollars, then you don't deserve to be in the business. <laughs> but if you're like me, if you're like me, you go me, on Goodwill Shop. You Goodwill. go to shop shopgoodwill.com, <laughs> and the reason why I have three GoPro threes is because I bought the other two through shopgoodwill.com, and I paid about thirty-five, forty dollars a piece for them. Wow! But the, you don't know how much the more expensive ones are. The six, seven, eight. Uh, there, well, this is the other thing about uh, about uh, GoPro is they typically make uh, one, two, or three different versions of the same model. For example, with uh, the GoPro 3 Plus and the 4 and the 5, they would have a white, silver, and black edition. And the white would be considered the, the most introductory. 
then the silver would have a little bit more advanced features and the black would, would you know, have the, everything but the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you can get, you know, that's how they tried to create affordability. Um, you know, the, with the Fusion that they're putting out now, the GoPro 8, I'm not sure that they're still doing that. But again, I mean, you know, if you can't afford a new one, go to KEH. Okay, or, but you, you don't know, know how much the new one is. Uh, the top of the line new one is still about $500. Okay, so yeah. that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. pretty that reasonable. That $500 price point is where they've been trying to keep to their top-end equipment. Right? Okay, okay. But, but you know, again, they were taking flack for not having equipment that was less than $500. Yeah, and people are spending thousands on a stupid phone. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I tell you, you what, know, I didn't. I fought that for the longest time, but now, you know, I got pickpocketed in Italy, and oh, I would, you wouldn't believe how careful I was being. <coughs> and other people tried to pickpocket me, but I was so aware, and then I got they got me anyway. Yeah. But anyway, I had just bought the phone. I'm, I actually, I'm still buying the phone because I have to pay yeah. the payments. But I went and just bought one used. I thought, well, this is what I'm doing from now on. It still cost me two hundred dollars for a yeah, used yeah, I'm sure iPhone, and I don't have the latest and greatest anymore. But no, that's all right. Yeah. So. But um, yeah, some of, some of the other things that, that these GoPros will do, like I said, the accessories are phenomenal. Uh, I have a battery pack, an extended life battery pack on ah. this. Uh, GoPros. One of their criticisms is that they're power hungry hogs. Okay. And they are. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, especially if you're using a visual back on the, uh, the you know, depending on the camera. Oh, so you can see. So you can see. This particular camera, the, the 3 Plus, you had to buy an extra uh, uh, viewfinder that would plug into the back oh, of it. Oh, that's right. I, I forgot about that because I can't see the picture yeah. when I'm... Right. Now, some of the newer models, though, that's built right into the camera. Ah. But those are power hungry. Yeah, so for this particular model, you have a battery pack that just you know just fits right on the back on the there, back. and this will extend. Uh, this will give you three, four times the amount of power okay. uh, that you would otherwise have. What other accessories? Uh, believe it or not, if you really wanted to, you can actually get a a faceplate to go onto the front of your GoPro, uh -huh. and that allows you to use your DSLR lenses. Uh, so you know, I could actually buy a faceplate for about 160 bucks, and that would be compatible with my Nikon DX lenses, and then I could use my 500 millimeter. Uh, oh my, my God! My um, and again, I mean, the sky is the limit. I mean, if you can, if you can think of it, you know, there's a very good chance that somebody has created a, you know, some type of an accessory. You know, for your GoPro. Let's talk about different things that we can do with it because you know the airboat thing. What a cool idea! Sure. Um, you know the the too. selfie stick pointing it down into a group of people. That's mm -hmm. a great idea. Yeah. Um, putting it on top of your camera, the hot shoot. Now, did you just is this put it together the parts that are already were there? No, I put that I put that all together. I ordered. The only thing that was there was just this, now. This is, is an, just if I hadn't said anything. Yeah, I know. Yeah, if I haven't told just our podcast audience, I'm talking about the mount that goes on the, the helmet, hot shoe. The helmet cam mount. The helmet cam mount that, go, but but John puts it on a hot shoe so he can put it on top of his camera. Right. and then on top of that, I have a uh, GoPro frame that goes on top of the the helmet mount bar, and then the camera snaps into the frame. But you just bought all of those separately, separately. And, s and they all snap together. Yeah, yeah, because uh, so you know, cool. all, all of the accessories are put together with these little knobs, little knobs, little bolts, uh, and uh, it, it works perfectly. Like I said, just consider all the accessories to be a set of Lego toys and, and just build whatever you want to build. I want to keep talking about ideas though, because I, I have a million accessories with mine, but I, I like look at them like, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this? I want to, I want more ideas and things that we can do. Like for instance, um, we used to do, which maybe I should start doing this again. We had so much fun. We used to do photo tours to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. And I met this man down there, David Baird, and he... Okay, because it's a small island, of course, so everybody knows everybody. And Kiki and the fire dancers used to model for us all the time, so we got to know them and all the fire dancers. And and uh, he was friends with her, and he put, I don't know if he did one or two GoPros. He put them on. He mounted them to hula hoop, and had her. There you go. He had the GoPro like facing her while she was 
you know, doing the hula hoop thing. <laughs> it was so sure, cool. Sure. I looked for it because I thought I would put that in the link when uh, we talked, but of course it was 10 years ago and yeah. he, he must have taken the video down because uh, it's gone. I couldn't find it. <laughs> have, have you ever seen any of these uh, sport fishing shows like uh, Wicked Tuna where they have pictures of, you know, they're fighting the tuna on, that's underwater? No. Uh, and so what, how do they do that? They throw a GoPro overboard. Uh, what you do you can, mean throw? How do you explain well, that? They, you, can actually, you can actually mount these things onto your fishing line if you wanted to. And uh, you, you know, you literally, you know, you developed a, a, a system where you can put this out, say, 10, 10 feet away from your lure. Uh, and so it's on the line, 10 feet away from the lure. Right, and it's pointed and at, pointing the, at, at the, the lure. lure so you can film the strike. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's so cool. And like I said, with, with an underwater camera housing that goes down to 197 feet, you know, you just you have to watch your depth, obviously. You know, but <laughs> but that gives you a lot of leeway. Wow! Uh, yeah. uh, you see, uh, you see stock car races all the time. Okay. Um, you know, that's that's an example where you can put GoPros in a co in a car. You know, for stock car racing, and they have a module where it wirelessly transmits. You know, the uh, you know the the uh, the image. Um, the Today Show, the Today Show uses GoPros all the time. Uh, they will use uh, the t uh, they will put Al Roker with a chest harness when he's doing something really weird and stupid, uh, or they're, I've even seen him in the kitchen where they used to have I don't know if your viewers can remember this, but in the old days, in order to be able to see what was in the mixing bowl, there would be a mirror at a 45 degree angle immediately above the the counter where the mixing bowl was at, and then there would be a camera shooting at the mirror that was you know doing the reflected image of what was in the mixing bowl. Well, now you just take a GoPro camera and you just point it down in there. <laughs> Put it on that selfie stick, right? Yeah. That, yeah. Oh yeah. my and, gosh. And, and sometimes they they just they shamelessly do it right there as part of the live shot. You know, other times it's just mounted above. And again, you you can you can uh, transmit the image wirelessly. The other neat thing about GoPros is that they all have Wi-Fi compatibility. Oh, yeah. okay. Let's talk yeah. about that for so, a minute. So, well, Wi-Fi compatibility, that's how you're able to control your camera wirelessly with either remote control or you can use your, your cell phone as well. But you uh, can also bring the picture back. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you can bring a video feed, a live video feed. You see it all the time in, in, in productions, in TV productions. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All wirelessly. Yeah. That, so, that again, blows my mind. When, you, when you take a look at you know, underwater capability, slow motion capability, 2.7 or the, the newer ones are, are 4K and the newest model uh, is now 5.8K uh, and it's just a matter of time before they're going to they're gonna go to 8K video you know, shooting. Wow. You have all of those things. You have uh, three, uh, three uh, you know, lens modes that you can go with. You have pro settings for different metering settings. Um, and what do you, when you say that, what do you mean? You can literally go in and you can change, you can you can change the way that the camera uh, uh, uses its light meter, just like on a DSLR, like, like a you know, spot like metering, a spot or, or matrix, or exactly. Oh, okay, okay. So you have all these different things, and again, ten years ago, if you could have had all those things all together, which you couldn't have, but if you could have, you would have probably had a hundred thousand dollars worth of gear wow. or more, you know, and. Uh, yeah. Now what? Tell me, because I'm not, I, I don't know that much about video. What about the? It's Heather wrote down as a question. How does altering the frame rate affect the final video? So what is she talking about there? Video is shot typically in either 24 uh, frames per second or 30 frames per second. Okay. Now you can shoot faster or slower as well. If you can shoot, if you want slow motion video, you can shoot at 60, 120, or 240 frames a second. Okay. The more frames per second when they're played back in normal time, then that's what creates the slow motion. Obviously, if you shot 120 frames a second and you played it back at 120 frames a second, it would just look like normal action. Okay. But when you typically are playing video back, you're playing it back at either 24 or 30 frames per second. When people are trying to emulate film, they like to shoot video at 24 frames per second. To, I still don't know why, to be perfectly honest with you. I guess it, you know, it doesn't do a whole lot for me, but for some people, it makes it 
have more of a film-like quality. Mm -hmm. um, than the 30 frames. Than the 30 frames per second. It's a video. It's yeah. a sharper video. It's well, I, not sharper. It's not sharper. It just has a different look to it. Okay. Uh, and I don't know why. Um, but uh, again, I mean, you can go, and again, you can, you can also do, do the time-lapse photography with this. Uh, so the frame rate is the key to everything. And uh, you know, you see a lot of times you'll see you know, uh, videos of the star fields moving across the sky, and there's people camping down the valley or whatever that type of thing. Uh, you know, that all has to do with frame rate. Uh, and uh, you know, when, if you're if you're realizing that normal frames per second is 24 to 30 frames per second, but you want to speed up that action, then you have to be good at math. <laughs> <laughs> ah. And you have to determine, okay, well, how many seconds do I want this shot to actually appear to be in my final production? And then, you know, how many frames do I need to be able to get that equivalent time, uh, time lapse? Okay. So, you know, again, if you're doing one frame a second, then you speed it up your, your video by 24 or 30 times. Okay. Uh, if you're doing two frames per second, you speed it up by 15 times. Yeah, you know, and so on and so forth. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. That yeah. makes sense. So, so would it be easier just to do it in post, or no? Uh, no, not at all. No, not at all. no. You have you have to be able to shoot it that way. Okay. I mean, you can make you can make changes, uh, you know, in post with the you know, the overall you know color correction. You know, you can do changes to a certain degree in uh, the exposure rate. Uh, but as far as the frame rates, no, you really can't. I mean, okay. there's a certain amount that you can, but you don't. You really don't want to mess around with your frame rates too much, you know, in post. Software does allow you to do that. You can slow down your. You, you can slow down or speed up uh, your frame rates by a factor of maybe 100%. Uh, but it's not as clean and it's not as, okay. as clear. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Good to know. I have another question though. Because of that wide angle lens. Do you get distortion when of you're course, taking pictures? Of course. Okay, so how yeah. do you deal with that? Uh, you just have to accept it. Uh, the one the one thing you can do is that when you're shooting ultra wide, is I like to make sure that my horizon line is as close to the middle of the frame as possible, okay. because it's that horizon line that shows the most distortion. Okay. So if you're in the middle of the frame, there is not nearly as much distortion. Now I know that you know from the rule of thirds that's not necessarily the best way to go, uh, but from the rule of distortion, that's, <laughs> the, rule that's of the distortion. That's, that's the only way to go. <laughs> sometimes, New rule sometimes invented you, by John Nelson: yeah. the rule of distortion. <laughs> sometimes you want that distortion. Sometimes you know it, it just again it depends on what you're trying to what you're trying to perform. Okay, all right, that's that's interesting. Now if you're doing still shots, you probably could straighten them out a little bit. But um, it might not look that great. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I'm not sure. I'm not uh, sure either. I don't even know if I've ever done a still shot on my GoPro. Um, I've always used it for video. Yeah. You can, uh, of course, in still photography, you, know, you, can, you can edit it out, you can crop, you, know, you can enlarge and crop all you want to. In videography, it does allow you, depending on your software, you can actually crop. Uh, and you can enlarge an image, and, and, and you can crop out part of your video image. But when like you're, zooming in, kind of. But when in you, post. but when you in post. But yeah. when you're doing that, then you're also giving up video clarity. Right. Uh, and so you don't want to do that too much. Um, a little oh, about uh, seven or eight years ago, I uh, got a call from a production company that was working for National Geographic, and they wanted to buy some footage of that I had shot of a loggerhead shrike taking a grasshopper and skewering it onto a thorn. Wow. And at first I thought, you know, right, you guys are just trying to rip me off. This isn't National Geographic. There's no way. Well, over the course of two weeks, they convinced me that it was. And, <laughs> it, and in fact, this GoPro camera right here was bought from the royalties that I, I got paid from uh, National Geographic for my video footage. And, it's, uh, nice. and if you ever go to uh, a series called The World's Deadliest, uh, I have I contributed fit, uh, video footage to that. But so you know, I, I just want to. You just made me think of something because a lot of our um, audience they really like to get into stock photography, and unfortunately, it's a lot of work for very little money. But mm -hmm. if that's what you want to do, add some video. Stock video is also a place to. My personal prefer preference is stock video. I think the stock video is a much hotter market than stock photography. Okay. 
Um, just to give you an idea, I've been shooting wildlife photography, you know, or videography rather, in Florida for about 14 or 15 years now. And in 15 years of going out in the field and, and shooting wildlife videography, I've met maybe seven or eight wildlife videographers. At the same time, you know, the number of wildlife photographers, you know, are, have been in the tens of thousands. There's not a whole lot of competition out there. Yeah. If, you're, if, if you can do it well, you know, and the well, that would be the hard thing for wildlife because how do you get close to the wildlife? Well, you have to do when you have that big, humongous, wide lens. It doesn't well. bother. There's two things you have to really be good at. Number one, you have to be patient. Oh. And number two, dang. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, though, is which is most important, you have to be able to understand and know your, your, your subject. You know, and it's just like being in a studio. When you bring a client into your studio to do you know, a portrait sitting, you, know, you want them to be at ease, you want to know who they are, develop a rapport. The same thing is true out in, out in the wild when I'm shooting a great blue heron. You know, I want to understand that bird, I want to know what its habits are, I want to know you know, how close I can get before I see that it's starting to display a natural behavior. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all those things are critically important. So as a photographer, I decided to become a Florida Master Naturalist. Oh, uh, it's okay. A, a, a lot a, of photographers uh, do that, yeah. it seems. Yeah, it's a 120-hour so course through the University of Florida, and you learn so much about, you know, the, not only the, the animals that you want to shoot, but also the settings, you know, where you can find those animals, when you can find those animals. Uh, and then you can use your GoPro with your other, with your other equipment. You don't, I, I rarely use a photo blind. Okay. I don't need, for most birds I don't need it. Uh, Kingfisher is an exception. Kingfishers are just incredibly neurotic birds. <laughs> Everyone talks about how hard they are, because they're are very fast terribly, too. terribly difficult to photograph and, and video. Um, but, uh, and they're very fast. Yeah, the smaller the bird, the faster they are. Yeah. You know, we have, uh, we, we affectionately call these little songbirds LBJs, little brown jobs. Uh. Uh, and they are just faster than grease lightning. Uh, but that's another reason why this GoPro is great because, for example, I can put a GoPro uh, up into a birdhouse. You know, and I get fabulous oh, shots inside. Could I put one? I have a cage put with right the bird inside. feeder in the middle so that I get my buntings because yeah. I love my paint. Oh, I yeah. only have oh, yeah. one male who comes around once in a great while, but I have three females that come every day. Yeah. So I could put that the GoPro actually in that cage, yeah, couldn't I? Yeah, absolutely. And then you control <gasps> it with your remote control. Oh, oh, I have to buy a remote control. How much yeah. is that? Goodwill, yeah. shop Goodwill. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. But yeah, paint, paint, painted buntings are awesome. You know, oh my gosh, they're no. Oh, the it, it, you, the painted bunting right on your card. Yeah, and that was shot with the in my backyard, uh, and uh, and he was flying towards the bird feeder. Uh, so this you know, is not with a GoPro though. That one is not with a GoPro. That was with my Nikon. With my that yeah, was a D seventy five hundred Nikon that I used. I've never gotten a picture of my buntings because they are very skittish. So if I go outside. They're right, it's right outside my window. Yeah. If I go outside, they're gone. I never, That's I've never bad. seen them That's when I'm out there. But I could put the GoPro in there. Yeah, you can put and the I GoPro. And I could do the remote through the, yeah. could what, I do what it through I, a window, what I do, do you think? Yeah, what, well, or do I have I, to open the window? No, you, you can do it right through the window, because it's Wi-Fi. All right, man, I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> what I do is I, I build my birdhouses, and I put a hole in the top of the birdhouse, and then when I want to, I just lay my GoPro you know, and the hole is just big enough for the lens, and I just put my GoPro right on top of the birdhouse with the lens shooting straight down. Uh, uh, you can put it on the side too if you wanted to. I, I haven't done that, but you could put it on the side, uh, and then just you know hold it with Velcro or something like that. Yeah, I have to uh, figure and out that, how that's I'll gr do this. that's great for a bird box or and a birdhouse. And I'm going to use my waterproof housing because I'm just going to leave it there, right? How, or will the battery die too quickly? Well, ev eventually the battery would die. You want to take you want to take it. How off. long will the battery not die before I have to like if I don't take it, any it footage? De it depends. On, it, well, it depends on the model and it depends on the health of your battery. Oh, uh, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I just but, wonder how uh, long I can leave it out there because he doesn't come around much, this guy. Yeah, well, you don't want other people to see your stuff laying around outside either because some little teenage brat might. Uh, 
I don't, I don't think it would notice it because it's right by my window, and well, you know true. what I mean. Yeah, I don't think yeah. people, unless you walked up to my house, to yeah. the, which yeah. people wouldn't. But yeah, bird boxes, bird feeders. Um, Great you idea. Can, yeah, you can even put them in a tree if you see. Like we've got two red-shouldered hawks right now that are mating in our backyard. Wow, yeah. sexy stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have, you should have seen some of my last Facebook posts. Let me tell you. <laughs> And uh, you know those I'm getting with you know with a telephoto lens, but you know once they nest, if you wanted to and you had the the capability, you could put a GoPro right up in the nest. Wow! Now you have to be very careful about doing stuff like that because typically what you want to do is you want to put your camera up before they start nesting because otherwise you can get in serious federal trouble, you know, for disturbing a, a nesting raptor. Oh, I thought they might attack you like my mockingbird. No, no, no. When my mockingbird next nests, man, she is violent. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But no, when you're talking about about uh, any kind of a bird of prey, there's special federal laws that apply, you know, to what you can and cannot do. Okay. So, so you know, while these cameras give you incredible capability, you have to make sure you're doing everything within the law and ethically. And you know what? I bet you can find that stuff out in Audubon, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Audubon would be a great resource. So tell us how we can find you. Um, theaudubonmoment.com is my personal website. Uh, and that shows some of my works, shows you some of my videos that, that I've been doing and a lot of my, of my still photography. Uh, it features uh, America's Amazon, this documentary I just got done putting together. You can also go to uh, the National Audubon Society and National Audubon Society has several resources for photographers okay. uh, that uh, will give you really good ideas on you know, photography tips and also on, on laws and, and, and ethics in, in wildlife photography. Because uh, any time that you're considered to be harassing wildlife, uh, that is a huge federal offense and you could lose all your equipment, be fined, go to jail, all the above or whatever. Okay, yikes. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. And what, what, what adventures do you have coming up next? This uh, is airing, I think, mid-May. Okay. Well, my, right now I'm starting work on my next documentary and it's going to be about the birds of Florida and specifically about the, uh, there was a recent report that was put out last September, September 2019, about why we have lost three billion birds over the last 40 years. Uh, there is a real concern now that we're losing a tremendous amount, 29% of our entire bird population in North America has disappeared. And I'm shooting a, a documentary on, on, based on that report but you know, showing, featuring some of the different bird species that have been affected you know, by our bird loss, you know, what's causing it, is it climate change, is it, is it w loss of wildlife habitat through urbanization, exploring all those things. Wow. You know, while, while you know, featuring some, some really nice high quality wildlife videography and still photography as well. Wow, that's awesome, yeah. that's awesome. How exciting. So the Audubon, moment the audubon moment dot com. com well thank yeah. you so much for being on the understand photography show you're welcome i thank appreciate you for it and to the audience thank you for joining us on the understand photography show we release a show every single week once a week and we're at what i don't know what is what did they say this was one, episode 192 so we've been doing it for a long time, almost four years. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of good shows in there. In fact, sometimes I re-release some of my favorite shows, or if some, you know, topic becomes very relevant. But this was a, a to me really exciting. I'm gonna I'm all in, I'm all uh, inspired to get my GoPro out and, and start playing around with it. Absolutely, <laughs> gotta make it do it. Uh, do don't it. forget to visit our website at understandphotography.com. I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks for joining us on the Understand Photography Show. Get up!